This is lecture seven in this course on antibiotics, and the topic is antibiotics for atypical infections. The learning objective is to know the spectrum of activity and major side effects for antibiotics active against atypical organisms. If you recall from lecture one, atypical bacteria is an inexact term applied to bacteria which are particularly unusual in cellular structure, morphology, biochemistry, or life cycle. In lecture two, I went over which bacterial species cause common acute infectious diseases, but not too many infections by atypical bacteria were mentioned. Since there are only five clinically relevant genera, I'm going to go ahead and review them all. Mycoplasma pneumoniae causes atypical pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia does not have a sharp demarcation from typical pneumonia caused by typical pathogens like strep pneumo and H flu. However, Atypical pneumonia can be contrasted with typical by having less sputum production, lack of leukocytosis, lack of consolidation on chest x-ray, and a greater number of mild extrapulmonary manifestations like achy joints and myalgias. People with atypical pneumonia, particularly when young and otherwise healthy, can feel more ill than they appear on physical exam. Some other species within the mycoplasma genus can rarely cause urinary tract infections. Another atypical bacteria genus is Chlamydia, the main species of which is C. trachomatis, which is a sexually transmitted disease. It leads to pelvic inflammatory disease in women, prostatitis in men, urethritis in both genders, pneumonia in neonates, and an eye disease called trachoma. Trachoma is a severe form of conjunctivitis that is one of the leading causes of blindness in the world. The genus Chlamydophila has two main pathogenic species, C. pneumoniae, which as its name suggests, causes atypical pneumonia, and C. psittacy, which causes psittacosis, a systemic illness presenting with fevers, rigors, myalgias, and dry cough, and which is transmitted by inhalation of organisms in dried bird feces. As the similar name may suggest, chlamydia and chlamydophila had been considered to be one genus until a proposal in 1999 divided into two, which is now the generally accepted taxonomy. The genus Rickettsia has many relevant species, of which I'll list just a couple, all of which are transmitted to humans by arthropods. Rickettsia Rickettsii causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, a potentially fatal tick-borne illness present in North and South America and despite its name, is actually most prevalent in the southeastern and south-central regions of the United States. R. typhi, R. prowazekii, and Orienti tsutsugamushi, which was until recently a member of the Rickettsia genus, these three species all cause forms of the disease typhus, the murine, epidemic, and scrub variants, respectively. Finally, Legionella pneumophila also causes an atypical pneumonia, which is frequently, and in my opinion, unfortunately known as Legionnaire's disease, since it was first discovered following an outbreak sickening hundreds in attendance at a 1976 convention of the U.S. military veterans group, the American Legion. While Legionella pneumonia has a relatively high case fatality rate, a more mild form of Legionella infection known as Pontiac fever, resembling the flu, is typically self-limited. It's named not after the former American car brand, but rather the town of Pontiac, Michigan, which was the site of a 1968 outbreak, the etiology of which was determined 10 years later. There are actually 17 other species of Legionella besides Pneumophila that have been associated with human disease, though most of them are quite rare. Although uncommonly discussed, taken together, Mycoplasma, Chlamydophila, and Legionella may account for up to 20% of all community-acquired pneumonia in the United States. There are only four options for treatment of atypical bacteria. First are the macrolides. For multiple reasons, azithromycin is the macrolide of choice here. It inhibits the 50S ribosomal subunit and shows excellent activity against mycoplasma, chlamydia, and legionella, but pretty minimal activity against rickettsia. Notable adverse reactions to azithromycin include QT prolongation, hepatic dysfunction, the possibility of exacerbating myasthenia gravis, and some macrolides, most prominently erythromycin, 
can alter GI motility. Tetracyclines, which as mentioned in another lecture, are usually limited to doxycycline in the US, cover all four atypical genera. Adverse reactions include erosive esophagitis, necessitating the patient to drink plenty of water and sit upright after administration. Also, doxy can cause photosensitivity and rarely tissue hyperpigmentation, which is more common in children. The quinolones are next. These cover everything well except rickettsia. Quinolones, which were discussed before, caused QT prolongation, may exacerbate myasthenia gravis as well, and can cause tendinopathy and tendon rupture, which is most common in patients over 60, women, patients with renal disease, patients who are post-organ transplant, and patients on oral steroids. Although I've had people tell me that Cipro does not have good atypical coverage, I haven't actually been able to find good supporting evidence of this in the literature or reference books. However, Cipro does not cover Streptococcus very well, so in general should not be used for any respiratory infection, even if it's suspected to be atypical, because atypical pneumonias could be mimicked by pneumonias caused by Streptococcus pneumoniae. The final treatment option is chloramphenicol, which is one of the earliest antibiotics, having been first introduced in 1949. Chloramphenicol shows great activity against mycoplasma, chlamydia, and rickettsia. I've actually been unable to find any good information about its activity against Legionella, probably because the drug has already fallen out of favor by the time Legionella was discovered. The most feared adverse reaction and primary reason for its near absence use in the developed world is aplastic anemia, which is generally fatal. What I find amazing is that the risk of this event is usually cited at 1 to 24,000 to 1 in 40,000, an estimate based on a single study from 1969. I don't know if a 1 in 24,000 chance of dying from medication sounds high or low to you, but to put things in perspective, the risk of death from a diagnostic colonoscopy is 1 to 3,000 to 1 to th in 30,000, the risk of death from a diagnostic cardiac catheterization is estimated at 1 in 1,000, and the risk of anaphylaxis from an IV penicillin is 1 in 2,500 to 1 in 10,000. The antibacterial coverage of chloramphenicol is very broad, and each dose costs only pennies to produce. As a consequence, its use is very common in the developing world, where antibiotics like zosin and cefepime may simply not be options. So what are actually the preferred antibiotics for each atypical bacteria? These preferences are based not only on in vitro activity, but also on clinical responses demonstrated in the available primary literature. The preferred treatment of mycoplasma pneumoniae is doxy, with any of the others listed as reasonable alternatives. Chlamydia trochomatis is best treated with either doxy or azithromycin, with levo listed as an alternative. To the best of my knowledge, moxie against this bacteria has not been studied in a clinical setting. Chlamydophila, both pneumoniae and cytosine, is best treated with doxy, with azithro, levo, or moxie as alternatives. Rickettsial infections, including the ones I did not specifically name earlier, are also best treated with doxy. Chloramphenicol is recommended as the alternative for use in pregnancy, as doxy is assigned a pregnancy risk factor D, which means there is evidence of fetal harm described in the literature. This is likely to be more trivia than something that will actually prove useful to you, but to the best of my knowledge, the treatment of rickettsial infections in pregnant women is the only time that chloramphenicol is preferentially used in the United States. Finally, Legionella is best treated with one of the two so-called respiratory quinolones with azithromycin as an alternative. That concludes this relatively brief lecture on antibiotics against atypical bacteria. The next lecture will discuss common side effects and toxicities of antibiotics, including a review of how to monitor drug levels of vancomycin and the aminoglycosides.